Welcome everybody to the student debates uh, of the 2020 ESA virtual annual meeting. My name is Lina Bernaola and I'm the outgoing student affairs committee chair. And I'm excited to share with all of you all the topics for this year's debate. Oops, sorry. First, let me give you a little bit of a, about the student debates. This is a fun annual tradition that brings together students from university teams that compete against each other by discussing opposing sides of current topics in entomology. Today, you will see the results of a, a year of hard work from these talented teams. These teams do not have to be formed by a single university. In fact, you will see today that we have uh, some teams representing more than one university, which is great. So as a bonus as well, all participants in the debates are winners. And you know why? Because this is the only uh, program at the ESA annual meeting that can directly culminate in an article, uh, in a peer review article uh, in the Journal of Insect Science. Isn't that that great? I think so. So if you are interested in participating and representing your university next year, I encourage you to form a team and be prepared when the open calls are made during the spring of 2021. Please, if you would like to uh, know more about the student debates, you can visit uh, the student, uh, the student debates website at ESA and, uh, website and uh, or require more information uh, later I will post uh, which links you can uh, click as well. So before we start, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Student Debate Subcommittee of the Student Affairs Committee for helping to organize this year's debate. Without your support and help, this event wouldn't be possible. Thank you very much to Patricia Prade, SAC Vice Chair and soon to be Chair of the Student Affairs Committee, Katie Britt, as a PI representative and Molly Darlington, PBT representative. In addition, a big component for the success of these debates is our panel of judges. All of them are, ki are kindly volunteering their time and contributing with their previous debate experiences. Thank you so much to Alejand Dr. Alejandro Del Pozo, Assistant Professor in Virginia Tech, Dr. Ashley Kennedy, tick biologist in the, at the Delaware Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Mosquito Control Section. Dr. Chris McCullough, postdoctoral researcher uh, in, at Virginia Tech. And finally, Hannah Kellhorst, PhD student at Kansas State University. Last but not least, I also would like to thank ESA staff for their help and support to make the student debates happen, especially in the logistics of this year. They are a big part of the success of this debate. So thank you so much to Cindy Myers, Becky Anthony, and Rosina Romano. Choosing this year's team. As uh, you can see, the team of this year is Entomology for All, Molecular Techniques and Science Communication to address current issues in entomology. We chose this team because our goal is to promote more discussion of current research that is of interest to all entomologists. Our topics highlight the best approaches to current real world problems through science communication. Here we go, the topics of this year 2020. We have two main topics. Topic one, what is the best taxonomic approach to identify and classify insects? And topic two, what is the best current technology to address the locust swarms worldwide? For the topic number one, we will uh, have an unbiased introduction by Molly Darlington and Morgan Roth, the uh, Ohio State University and Min University of Minnesota will team up against the Agatories, also known as Texas A&M and University of Florida. For the topic number two, we will have an unbiased introduction by Katie Britt and Patricia Prade, and uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln will team up against the team of University of Florida, Purdue, and Michigan State University. 
Just to give you a, an idea about the flow of the debates that will happen for each topic. We will start with five minutes of the unbiased introduction from a non-debate team member, then seven minutes of a stance introduction by team one, followed by team two as well. Then five minutes of cross-examination by team two, followed, followed by a five minutes rebuttal by team one. Then five minutes of cross-examination by team one, followed by five minutes rebuttal by team two. After that, we will have one more rebuttal round for each team. Finally, there will be 10 minutes per questions. So uh, where judges will ask questions first, followed by the audience in remaining time. I would like to say, I would like to uh, also encourage our attendees to please uh, in those 10 minutes, if you have any question, as soon as you have it, try to uh, post those in the, uh, Q&A window chat so that uh, we can get your questions on time. And don't forget also to address to which team or individual you want to ask a question. As final debate updates, before we start, I would like to remind everyone to attend the student award ceremony this afternoon from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, where debate team winners will be announced. So come please to cheer them. Uh, to come to and share to them. So if you're interested to a uh, next year's debate, you can contact ESA student debate at gmail.com for more information. So let now let's start with our unbiased introduction the speaker, Molly Darlington. Thanks, Lena. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Lena. This uh, introduction was put together by myself, Molly, and Morgan Roth. So for topic one, what is the best taxonomic approach to classify and identify insects? Insect taxonomy lies at the heart of entomology, and for hundreds of years, insect classification was rooted in morphological observations. Insect morphology is a reliable standard upon which numerous books and dichotomous keys are based and has led to the identification of over 1 million insect species thus far. Nevertheless, it is estimated that millions of spe insect species have yet to be classified. Although entomologists of the past did not have a choice regarding classification methods, the development of molecular techniques over the last few decades now offers an alternative to morphology-based taxonomy. The question then remains, which method is best? Humans have classified animals for centuries, evidenced by Aristotle's Historia Animalium, published in the 4th century BC. This book contains one of the oldest surviving classification systems of insects, utilizing physical characteristics for correlation purposes. Throughout the following millennia, scholars continued to search for morphological patterns within the natural world, adopting new technologies as the years progressed, such as the printing press and optics innovations. Aldrovandi's 1602 De Animalibus Insectis Libre the Seventh was the first text exclusively dedicated to entomology and provided a summary on insect morphology. And John Ray's 1710 Historia Insectorum was an early attempt to develop a system of classification based on morphology, amongst other things. Any brief history of insect taxonomy would be incomplete without mentioning Carl Linnaeus's 1758 Systema Naturae, which reorganized insecta into seven orders based on morphological characteristics such as wings. Finally, in the 19th century, the cladistic revolution popularized by Emil Hans Willi Henning introduced the idea of shared derived characteristics and hierarchical evolutionary relationships into taxonomy, ideas of which still inform methodologies today. Countless other women and men spent their lives contributing to our current knowledge base of insect morphology and taxonomy over the years. Morphology-based taxonomy has had a rich history and for centuries was referenced as the standard for insect classification. However, over the years, scholars routinely utilized technological innovations to characterize and classify insect specimens, and the molecular revolution of the 20th century was no different. The term molecular biology was first used in 1938. Since then, our understanding and perspective of the natural world have forever changed, and along with it, our ability to identify and classify evolutionary relationships. The field of molecular systematics began to take shape in the 50s and 60s, and publications using molecular and phylogenetics as keywords have grown exponentially since 1981. 
The first method mention of DNA barcoding for insect identification was in 2003, suggesting that the mitochondrial gene cytochrome C oxidase 1 could be used for species identification. Since then, DNA barcoding has been applied to numerous insect orders and is being used to compile databases in which biodiversity data and genetic information can be overlaid to help further knowledge of species richness. As of 2018, 3,756 papers with DNA barcoded included in the abstract have been published. The use of other methods such as restriction fragment length polymorphism, amplified fragment length polymorphism, and especially molecular phylogenetics have benefited from advancements in molecular biology, computational speeds, and bioinformatics. Utilization of omics and advanced computational methodologies for taxonomic purposes are just the most recent recruitments in a long and storied history of incorporating novel ideas and technologies to enhance the identification and classification of the natural world around us. Those in favor of morphology-based classification assert expertise is needed to utilize molecular methods, while morphology remains easily acceptable with international standards and large databases available. Additionally, morphology-based methods facilitate citizen science, encouraging collaborations between scientists and the general public, broadening interest in entomology. Proponents of molecular approaches note these methods are useful when classifying cryptic species and immatures, yield quick results, are steadily becoming more affordable, and foster multidisciplinary collaborations. Ultimately, both molecular and morphology-based classification offer useful ways to achieve the same goal, and it remains to be seen which method will prevail in the future of insect taxonomy. Thank you, Molly. Okay, so I think we are still a little bit early for uh, introduce the first uh, debate team. Um, we will wait a few minutes or a uh, Okay, after our unbiased introduction for topic number one, I would like to invite now the uh, team number one, the Ohio State University and University of Minnesota to give their uh, stance introduction. Adrian, please introduce all your team members. Oh uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Adrian Pekarsik, team leader of Team Ohio State and University of Minnesota, and our team is composed of uh, Dylan Rick from Ohio State and from University of Minnesota, we have Michelle Boone and An Tran, and I'd like to just give a brief shout out to uh, Sujaya Rao, our faculty advisor from Minnesota. All right. Oh, geez. All right. I just uh, also would quickly like to thank the student uh, debate subcommittee for hosting this event and for coordinating everything amongst us. So morph morphological identification is the best taxonomic approach to identify and classify insects. The description, classification, and naming of organisms is also known as taxonomy. For centuries, taxonomists have identified and classified insect species based on their physical features, which has led to the production and descriptive production of descriptive and illustrated species keys and guides for insects around the world. Morphological identification is relied upon by many peoples and industries, ranging from public health to agriculture. Regardless of the industry, however, accurate taxonomy is critical for the successful integrated pest management of these species because different insects require different management strategies. For example, morphological features were used to determine that the wrong parasitoid species was released to control the California red scale and citrus. They were also used to help identify a new pest of soybean, Roselliella maxima, which recently emerged in the Midwest and was quickly described so farmers could have the information to aid in scouting and management. Morphological identification has evolved to incorporate technological innovations and analytical approaches like automated machine learning, scanning electron microscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, and the digitization of museum collections, resources that were once out of reach for many. Some of these technologies, such as machine learning, hold promise to be more accurate than human experts at identifying species. Furthermore, Valen et al. in 2019 found that neural networks 
were able to identify specimens and photographs regardless of the angle or orientation that they were taken in. Many of these technologies are being integrated into smartphone-based applications, which are accessible to people around the world. Global online databases like iNaturalist and BugGuide.net provide users with an easy to use application to identify insects and even allow them to upload their own specimen images with a location and timestamp, generating a non-destructive natural history record of the modern world. These databases are widely used. For example, iNaturalist has at least 5 million taxonomic records. They are also beneficial in tracking insect species like emerging pests. The early detection and distribution mapping system of North America lets users to re report occurrences of uh, invasive insects just based on their observation in the field. And ultimately, this lets researchers cover a whole lot more ground without having to increase cost or efforts. These applications provide users the resources to learn taxonomy through the lens of morphology on their own. And there are oftentimes experts present to verify the identities of the submitted records. Ultimately, new imaging technologies have the potential to discover, identify, and classify new species from digitized collections, facilitate community science projects between the public and researchers, and even arrange species phylogenetically. Morphological identification is a definitive tried and true process for taxonomy as it is based on dichotomous traits that, it can, that can account for intraspecific variation, such as phenotypic plasticity. Although it can take up to six months to go from sample collection to species identification and potentially require an expert to confirm the identification, morphological characteristics are the foundation of taxonomy and the basis of identification for other approaches. In particular, molecular approaches that promise the rapid identification of species are really just another line of evidence for the morphological identification and act as a complement to but not replacement of. Despite the promises of molecular identification, it is a non-definitive approach that is based on sequence similarity and rooted in the morphological verification of physical specimens. Molecular identification of new species not only compounds the limitations encountered through morphology, but instead introduces additional steps and challenges. These methodologies are largely inaccessible in many developing countries as well. The technologies are rapidly evolving every day. Uh, they require specialized training and uh, expertise, and they also require expensive resources such as journals and genomic and or computational facilities to process the data and these are very expensive. On average, it costs about 1.7 to 3.4 times more money to identify a specimen using molecular techniques than if you were to use morphological characters. There are also no concrete rules for identifying and classifying insects using molecular techniques. Molecular identification is a tenuous, and tenuous process and the results can be skewed by the inappropriate use of neighbor joining trees, bootstrap resampling, fixed distance thresholds, and interpretation of the barcoding gap. Additionally, phylogenetic analyses are influenced by recent speciation events, paraphyly, which is present in about 23% of animal species, interspecific hybridization, poorly established taxonomies, and high infection rates of endosymbionts like Wolbachia, which can interfere with the sequencing signal. Unlike morphological identification, which is rooted in binomial nomenclature and regulated by the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature, molecular-based species identification lacks a universally accepted nomenclature system, and each database uses their own classification schemes. Additionally, DNA barcoding repositories such as NCBI and BOLD only account for a fraction of known species, and one study found that 42% of invasive insects were actually missing from bold. While DNA barcoding may provide a quick identification for well-studied species, Schlick Steiner et al. in 2010 reviewed 140 phylogenetic studies and determined that morphological techniques would have identified more insect, more species successfully than molecular techniques when used in isolation. These are reasons why morphological identification will continue to be relied upon for insect identification and classification 
and molecular identification will continue to serve as a complement to, but not replacement of morphology. Thank you, Adrian. Our next uh, team is, okay, great, Joanny King from Texas A&M University of Florida. Please introduce your team. Howdy, thanks for being here, y'all. My team is Morgan Thompson, Kelly Carruthers, and also our advisor is Dr. Juliana Rangel. So thank you, Dr. Rangel, and also thank you, Lena, for all of your hard work. Oh, I need to, I'm sorry. I need to share my screen here. Whew. Nerves. Okay, share screen. Can you see my presentation? Thank you. When we are talking about taxonomy, we are referring to two things, identification and classification. When we're talking about arthropod identification or insect identification, this refers to putting a name to a specimen. In other words, the red imported fire ant is Solenopsis invicta. While classification is categorizing and placing a specimen within a phylogeny, in other words, Solenopsis invicta is in the genus Solenopsis, which is in the family Formicidae, which is in the order Hymenoptera. Molecular techniques are the best approach for insect classification and identification and we hope to convince you of this in the debate today. There are clear advantages uh, for molecular techniques for insect identification. They are ideal for categorizing insect species which are difficult to identify by sight. Think of things such as cryptic species which can be pests or endangered species. They are also ideal for assigning immature forms to the proper taxonomic group. Think about holometabolous uh, arthropod, uh, insects, holometabolous insects, which the immature larval stages look completely different from the adults and often don't have reliable morphological characters to use. Molecular techniques are also good for identifying endoparasitoids, so thinking of uh, hyperparasitoids, and it also would require less time to dissect out all of the um, parasitoids from hosts. It's also good for decaying specimens, so specimens which morphological characters are no longer distinguishable. Molecular technologies are also ideal for helping describe biodiversities in areas that have many similar looking species. There was a recent study um, from India which uh, assessed all the biodiversity of calcid wasps, which are very important for the area. Molecular techniques are ideal for identifying pests because they're more specific, sensitive, accurate, and quicker. It's ideal for biosecurity to prevent invasive species. Think of all the global trade that we have these days. It also helps with detection of hybrids. DNA barcoding has been successful in distinguishing morphologically similar pest species such as mosquitoes in the adult and immature stages. Mosquitoes are vectors of a variety of diseases uh, around the world, so this can help with mm -hmm. identifying them. You can also identify novel taxa as potential vectors of diseases and other than DNA barcoding, there are other high throughput technologies such as matrix assess assisted laser desorptive ionization time of flight mass spectrometry, which has been successful at identifying pests such as ticks with their pathogens. Molecular techniques provide uh, <clears throat> less reliance on specialized experts. Morphological identification usually requires the work of specialized taxonomists. This takes years of training. Uh, unfortunately, there's been reduced popularity in taxonomy as a field of study because of this. Um, however, many molecular techniques can be used by a variety of scientists in the need of identifying an insect. The classical use of morphological traits requires a highly trained expert to identify, whereas it is less so with molecular methods. Now, this isn't a call for less taxonomists, uh, quite the contrary. It's a call for more taxonomy with um, an interdisciplinary approach. Molecular techniques also have clear advantages for insect classification. Phylogenetic modeling is the key method for determining monophyly. From family to species classification when there are no useful morphological characteristics, molecular techniques shine. Also can help identify convergent evolution, such as thinking of, thinking of eusocial behaviors and caste systems among hymenoptera. Uh, eusociality has evolved multiple times within the hymenoptera. Mitochondrial markers are uh, useful for systematic and phylogenetic studies. 
And there are other advantages with insect classification because molecular technologies can help us unravel how developmental and phylogenetic processes change over time and across lineages uh, via genomics. Uh, again, the use of matures and adult stages for determining phylogenetic relationships can be used. So matures, immatures have been neglected uh, because of their lack of morphological characters, but th this is a way to include them. So to conclude, arthropod classification clearly benefits molecular methods, and these methods continue to improve and be are becoming less expensive with time. Thousands of genes and genomes are now available for analyses, which has resulted in higher level insect phylogeny consensus. Mitogenomics has vastly improved phylogenetic analysis and detection of variation among sister species and populations is able to happen. I'd like to also note that with um, classification, the strep sipter problem was able to be resolved because of molecular techniques there are also clear advantages for arthropod identification. Um, it's ideal, molecular uh, techniques are ideal for a variety of practical applications such as identifying pest species. Can morphology keep up thinking of like global invasive species? We are becoming increasingly aware of the genetic variability with in invasive insect pest species, which we often define as different strains. Identifying which strain is invading a specific region influences our management strategies. Uh, there are also uh, implications for conservation biology. You can get the identification of a species such as butterflies in a short period of time and catalog biodiversity and sensitive areas. Um, and this is important thinking of climate change. So uh, cataloging biodiversity in the face of climate change. So molecular techniques have clear advantages over morphology. Reducing specialization of taxonomic groups may lead to more collaborations across disparate disciplines of entomology. And to quote Novotani and Miller, insect taxonomy is entering a revolution fueled by molecular techniques. This is the way that the direction and that the future of taxonomy is heading. Thank you. Thank you, Joanny. It's a tough topic to debate. Okay, now uh, we have cross-examination of uh, Ohio State University, University of Minnesota by the Agatoris. You have five minutes to ask questions or clarifications. Give me one second. Uh, one, two, okay, I wanna see all the team, perfect. Okay, so one, two, three, go. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation about um, getting proper and quick identification for pest identifications. How do you get accurate identification for pests that are cryptic? To piggyback off of that, if that's okay. Um, as far as pests are concerned, like in the example with the uh, Rosellella, um, was that mainly done by morphological stuff or did the molecular aspect influence how those insects were actually um, differentiated? Because it also looks like there was only um, one male and female specimen used. Is that sufficient to be able to make morphological um, assumptions? Um, and further, I would like to um, just remind us uh, of what exactly we're debating today. So we're thinking about um, both insect identification, but we also can't forget insect classification. Um, and as we highlighted in our references, um, and as Joni also nicely uh, put in our introduction, our current phylogeny for insects is based uh, entirely on phylogenomic methods. So really this is what's at the forefront of how we think about and organize and classify insects. And so I think that this is really important when we're moving forward in the debate is to think about this classification component. And uh, currently I don't think our opponents really have a clear argument for why morphology is better or the best approach. And so we have outlined a number of reasons. Also um, genomic methods, uh, as Joni highlighted in a number of our sources are vastly superior in terms of determining convergent evolution as well as instances of hybridization. And we also feel that um, in species delineation, genetic and uh, molecular techniques are far superior. If 
we also have some more time for questions. Do we have more time? Uh, I would like to ask about uh, in the their introduction, they mentioned that um, molecular techniques are largely inaccessible in many developing countries. However, with some of our references, uh, there were some developing countries such as uh, areas in India, which they were able to use these techniques. And they stated that it was more ideal for them because they didn't need a highly specialized taxonomist to train uh, in morphological uh, methods. So I was wondering what you thought about that in terms of that um, these techniques aren't available in developing countries, if, if you, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and another I, quote. Oh, oh, go ahead, yeah. Kelly. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just wanted to ask about costs of um, like the accuracy as compared to morphology. So it's stated it's 1.7 to 3.4 times as costly to do molecular versus morphology. Is, is that an accurate representation of costs both uh, directly from that paper and in terms of like costs future wise. Yeah, that's a great point, Kelly. And it's also really important to note that in that paper, um, they noted that next generation uh, sequencing methods were actually cheaper um, than in numerous instances than the traditional morphological traits. And it was really only, uh, that statistic was somewhat skewed because it was really only when you were looking at somewhat outdated Sanger sequencing methods that it was more expensive. Um, so we would like some clarification on that by the other team if they could provide it. Um, and another point that I would like to just bring up in terms of um, their uh, Akron et al. 2017 paper on citizen science, um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a great effort to include um, the public in our scientific endeavors and um, but I, I would also like to point out that that paper uh, not only references morphology, but also notes that DNA alignment of DNA sequences um, can also be a way to engage the public in citizen science. So I would just like to highlight that molecular approaches are also included in that reference and citizen science can also um, rely on molecular techniques and engagement from the public in that way. Um, so if the, uh, if the other team could clarify um, exactly what uh, the advantages are for morphology with citizen science, that would be great as well. And I'd like to bounce off of that, Morgan, because that's a great point that the general public does need to have more. Team number two, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Agatoris. So uh, now we will have our first rebuttal by, Ohio, by the Ohio State University and a University of Minnesota team. You have five minutes uh, in, okay, I will wait for Anne and Michelle. Okay, five minutes is starting, one, two, three, go. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> On the first question, on the identification of cryptic species, um, I'd like to point out that in uh, Agatory's own reference, uh, Batovska et al. 2016, although some uh, cryptic mosquitoes in Australia could only be detected with DNA, others would not have been distinguished by DNA alone. And this is related uh, to the barcoding gap uh, that Adrian alluded to. Um, this uh, describes the incomplete uh, reference libraries that are currently available for various taxa. And in fact, the same paper found that only 25% of mosquitoes endemic to Australia had been barcoded uh, from Australian samples, which is important if you wanna capture geographic variation that you need to identify um, uh, otherwise cryptic species in uh, a particular range. Um, this is also related to uh, uh, issues of uh, the actual uh, accessibility and implementation of DNA-based methods in the field for pest identification. And this was the topic of a uh, reference of theirs, uh, Spadaro et al. 2020, which uh, enumerates various DNA methods, such as loop-mediated isothermal amplification and others, which, um, although they may be cutting edge, um, are not necessarily uh, accessible to general uh, pest uh, management practitioners, uh, in addition to overhead costs that are associated with those. 
Um, if I could respond about the pest identification for uh, reg Regalilelia <laughs> maxima, that the soybean gall midge, um, they, uh, in the paper, they explicitly state that they used molecular uh, verification just to confirm that it didn't match any other species as just like a final say that, yes, this is a new species. But they were able to distinguish it just based off of morphological features alone. And I would like to respond to um, the cost. And in Wines 20, 2004, they looked at the direct cost, of the, uh, which includes the sampling, collecting, and the technicians involved for um, doing these type of te um, techniques between morphology and molecular. And it does cost more because um, sometimes molecular techniques do not include those things, such as cleaning up. And sometimes molecular technique could cost 10 times more if it doesn't work the first time. Um, I would like to speak about your question about the accessibility of um, identification techniques in developing countries. So Helmi et al. 2016 noted several reasons why genomic sequencing is largely inaccessible in developing nations. Um, and you mentioned India specifically, but uh, Helmi's figure one shows a dearth of genomic facilities in most of Africa, parts of the Middle East, Southeast Asia, parts of Central America, and a lot of uh, countries in the northern part of South America. So there is still this dearth in many of these countries. It's not just India. But additionally, the cost of these genomic facilities is estimated between $100,000 and $700,000 to establish. And it's even higher in countries that must import sequencing equipment. So I think it's really inaccurate to say that molecular identification methods are largely accessible in many developing nations. Additionally, you mentioned um, identifying species in developing nations like, or for example, you mentioned India. And in one of your papers, Rasul et al. in 2018, they actually uh, mentioned that the number of barcodes generated from India is 4.6% of known species. And the corresponding global scenario is about 16% of global spe of described species. So there are a lot more species that need to be included into these uh, databases in order for it to be much more easy and efficient for anyone around the world. And then um, you mentioned how um, insect classification identification and that morphological isn't useful in phylogeny. Wines and all debates that in his paper, morphological data is still important for phylogeny reconstruction. Uh, going off of phylogenetic reconstruction too, Novotny and Miller 2014 stated that phylogenetic relationships re resolved to the species level is much less satisfactory in insects relative to other animals like plants or birds. I can also address your question about ACORN 2019 and community science because you mentioned that, yes, they did. Uh, they're, they mentioned a project that used molecular techniques, but the best community science is a two-way street in which citizens, um, they provide- Team one, time's up. Thank you so much, team one. Now uh, we will go to a cross-examination of the agatories by the Ohio State University and University of Minnesota team. And one, two, three, go. So you mentioned that uh, molecular techniques are faster at identifying species than morphological techniques, but how would this be the case for unidentified species that haven't even been identified morphologically? You mentioned that molecular techniques can be used for immatures. However, in your reference, Meyer and Lim, they mentioned that usually fresh material is needed. How will you do this with the way immatures are preserved in museums? On the topic of uh, existing specimens and collections, uh, you mentioned that uh, molecular approaches are uh, suited to uh, analyze uh, dry pen specimens. And I'm just curious um, uh, why you uh, think that's the case, uh, especially in light of uh, your reference to Dang et al. 2019. Uh, they looked at the uh, publication rate of species descriptions utilizing DNA um, and uh, mentioned uh, another reference, Luo et al. 2015, 
uh, that arrived at a rule of thumb of at least 20 specimens per species, uh, assuming uh, DNA approaches are being used in order to classify and place uh, a given species, uh, which I imagine would be even greater for pen specimens that are uh, partly decayed. You had also mentioned that molecular identification is useful for endangered species. So I was hoping you could expand a little bit on how that can be useful to a large number of people when you have to have these special permits that can take a long time in order to collect specimen and tissue samples from endangered species. I was wondering if you could expand on how DNA barcoding will help if there's a new invasive, since there's limited genome sequences. Do you have a citation for your definition of insect classification? But you also can you also mention, can you also mention how molecular techniques helped with management oversight? And could you talk a little bit more about how farmers in the field can use molecular techniques to identify pests? If you can expand on what you mean by using molecular technique for assigning taxonomic names to species. And also Finally, what is, or go on Dylan. Okay, thank you. Um, on the topic of con uh, convergent evolution that you mentioned in Hymenoptera, that paper, um, I'm just curious how that topic of convergent evolution uh, relates to taxonomic identification, um, uh, the subject of today's debate. And is there a unified classification scheme that DNA barcoding will use for the future that will make it all uh, kind of just regulated under the same umbrella? Oh, and sorry to backstep to my previous question. That paper that was cited was on the evolution of sociality in different hymenopteran linea lineages and nothing that would uh, throw off uh, taxonomic placement in the first place. I would just like to, uh, so in light of that, I, I would like to know how that relates to taxonomic identification. I'm also curious to know if you could expand on how molecular techniques could help farmers when they need information at the moment. And in addition, what did you mean by um, not needing specializations or training in molecular technique? You still have one minute. You talk about the future of insect identification, but how will molecular techniques help identification right now? You also mentioned that uh, DNA techniques are more useful, but could you speak to the proportion of taxonomic identifications that have DNA data compared to those that are based solely on morphology? You talked a little bit about insect vectors to human diseases as well. Could you re-explain how is this relevant to insect identification? Tim Wan, time up. Thank you, Tim Wan. Now we will have the review time for the avatories. Avatar is on the screen and you will have five minutes to review it. And what is Joanny? I think we're just waiting for Joanny. Uh -huh. Sorry, I glitched out. <laughs> okay. So five minutes in one, two, three. Yes, I would like to answer your question about not require, requiring training for molecular technologies. Uh, I, we didn't say that you don't require training, it just requires less training because training an individual to be an expert in uh, tax, like a taxonomic group takes a lot of time, like years of training. So we never said that it requires um, no training, it just requires less specific training with less time. 
Exactly, Joni. Yeah, and I would love to highlight to you, uh, the paper LaSalle et al. 20, uh, two, from 2009 that the other team uh, referenced where um, the authors there make a point of just specifying just how much training goes into becoming a specialized expert in taxonomy if you're coming at it strictly from a morphological perspective. And our own citation of Burkent uh, from 2018 also highlights this. Um, so it, it's great to become specialized in one particular group uh, as a morphologist, but um, when you become trained in these molecular techniques, you can apply them to any group because uh, any insect has genomic data that you can work with. Um, so therefore you're no longer limited to your one specific order or family or even genus of a particular species. And now you can explore across, across a much wider range of insects. Um, so that was our point there. Um, also to the point of uh, convergent evolution and wondering how it relates to the debate today, I think it's incredibly important in our debate today. Again, thinking about insect classification. So how do we put these insects in a relevant phylogenetic framework? Um, if we see, uh, for example, if we're taking the other team's stance and we think about morphological characteristics, if we're just looking at two morphological characteristics from very distantly related taxa, but perhaps they happen to be the same uh, morphological trait, um, then if we're just going based off of morphology alone, then we have this instance of convergent evolution in our phylogeny is essentially um, completely inaccurate. And so I think our paper on the evolution of sociality really nicely highlights this, right? If we um, just grouped everything based purely on uh, that particular trait, that characteristic, um, then our phylogeny is completely different from the, again, accepted phylogeny, which is based again on a phylogenomic framework. Um, and, uh, Oh, and I would also like to expand on the question about how this is relevant to farmers. I think uh, morphological techniques are extremely relevant to farmers. And again, I want to point everyone to our reference, Tay and Gordon from 2019 on invasive species and thinking about different strains of insects. Fall armyworm, for example, you could have a completely different strain of that particular pest. So for uh, someone, for a farmer to know what strain of a particular insect that they're dealing with, that completely changes their management strategy. Um, and so, and I would also like to allow my teammates to chime in. <laughs> yes, and uh, I would like to point out the, the Burns 2015 paper about eusociality in Hymenoptera. The, the, the purpose of that is to show that um, traits can arise um, convergently and that these techniques can help with us identifying like synapomorphies and that sort of thing. So that's that's the purpose of that citation. But I'd also like to, to point out that some of your references for the things that you're using are very old. They're more than um, 10 years old or eight years old. And a lot of our references for the things that we're referring to are more recent and current. And uh, it's, it's um, these molecular technologies have become more affordable throughout time throughout the last 10 years. So um, yeah, that's a great point, Joni. And in particular, the, um, the Waynes et al. paper from, uh, from the opposing team uh, is 15 years old. So it is extremely outdated. And we know for a fact that these molecular technologies are rapidly decreasing in cost. And so our team, um, purely on the basis of how outdated that paper is, doesn't think that it's relevant to our particular debate today. Just to chime in about cost, though, the particular paper, and I, it is the Stein et al. paper about DNA co barcoding costing between 1.7 and 3.4 times. It's more like 1.7 because that's the whole range there is inclusive of fish and diatoms, which isn't relevant to our debate discussion. And that number alone actually only includes benthic uh, macron vertebrates. So it's not clear if that's particularly insects either. Um, also about, there were only 15% of insects cataloged. I think that's a bit unfair because the, the Kvist paper that you talk about, there are well over a million species of insects that have been identified at this point through DNA barcoding, but because it's such a hyper diverse- Time to time up. Thank you so much, Agatoris. So uh, we conclude the first uh, part of the debate. I mean, because we need to go to a break. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, just five minutes, and we will come back with a second uh, rebuttal uh, for both teams. So it's 1.20, we, we will be back at 
no, sorry, 11, uh, for me, Central Time, 11.25. Okay, so, uh, let's continue with our second review by the Ohio State University and University of Minnesota uh, team. You have five minutes starting now. You mentioned about the cost and you said that it was a little biased saying that the cost was not 1.7 to 3 point um, by Stein at all. So your paper by Murata at all, um, their high range was $10 per specimen. So this actually could cost more than what was um, mentioned by Stein. I would also like to mention that 1.7 is almost tw two, which is twice as much. So that is quite a cost, especially for people like farmers who are on strict budgets. Um, in terms of having a quick identification for uh, agriculture in particular, or just pest management, DARA 20, 2019 states that regardless of the goal behind IPM, all successful programs depend on correct identification of the pest and that early detection of these pests in many cases can help address the pest situation by low cost spot treatment. So it's really important that these farmers are able to just go outside, look, be able to determine what kind of insect it is, and then they can make management decisions right then before the insect has time to cause issues. Additionally, a lot of farmers, they, they're pretty aware of the field history that they're work, of the field they're working in, and they communicate with others in the region about the different insects they're experiencing. So just that community science-based approach from farmers alone would, in my opinion, make morphological techniques a much better and useful uh, way to identify pests. And to piggyback off that and continue my thought from the first um, section, in terms of community science, it's not just about what information can we get from the community, it's also what information can we provide them for identification. And along that note, um, Bug Guide, as stated by uh, in that ACORN 2019 paper, is an online insect database that uses photographs for species ID, and it's become the single most heavily used identification resource for arthropods in North America, and it's even led to new species discoveries. On the topic of uh, specialized training uh, that may be required for a mo uh, morphological taxonomist, um, I'd like to point out that morphological and uh, biodiversity types of topics in education um, uh, may be falling by the wayside uh, uh, in favor of genetic approaches. And uh, this is actually touched on in a reference uh, of uh, the Agathores, uh, Borkent 2018, that goes, uh, students are learning how to manage the data rather than, than having a background in insect morphology development and behavior that would provide the tools necessary to think about what character states might mean and the relative worth in indicating relationships. Um, and so really this could just be part of a greater and more holistic uh, background training um, uh, not necessarily a super specialized uh, kind of hindrance to biological education, but morphology really can contextualize uh, the rest of evolutionary topics uh, more so. And furthermore, to your point about the age of resources, older resources are not necessarily bad and morphological keys have a much longer shelf life than molecular techniques because that's such a rapidly changing field. So in a lot of places, particularly in developing countries, there's limited access to up-to-date scientific literature. So that can actually be a hindrance. Additionally, a lot of these issues that are experienced from DNA barcoding, um, Meyer and Paul, or Paula and Meyer, 2005, and um, oh gosh, and Collins and Crookshanks, uh, they both uh, list a long list of reasons, including things that are mainly human controlled, like how many bootstrap replicates there are, how the neighbor joining tree is occurred, which um, other species they include in the analysis. These all can have, they can all change the outcome in identification of species, and they can actually cause misidentifications. Uh, Spadaro et al. 2020 states, there are no fixed rules to establish the amount of genetic variation associated with speciation. Uh, Virgilio et al. in 2010 also states that the accuracy of a phylogeny slightly decreases as the number of species included in the analysis increases. And in, in a general sense, it's about a decline of four to 5% accuracy uh, when 
at least 1800 or more species are included in the analysis. So as you increase from there, you'll continue to decline in your accuracy. And going back to the cost, I failed to mention and Michelle's point about the time of how old dated are. Stein et al. papers from 2014 and Murata et al. is your paper from 2019. Come on, time's up. And Okay, team number one, thank you. So now a um, review time for team number two, Agatoris on the screen. Okay, you have five minutes in one, two, three. Okay, just to mention a few things. So about neighbor joining trees and phylogenetics, um, Yes, they can decrease the more species that you add and with the specific characters, but there are going to be biases when the characters are chosen morphologically as well. Um, the cost bit, yeah, it could be $10 per, $10 per specimen, but again, this is a convenience effort because you're going to take months and months to get an identification back. Whereas with DNA barcoding or kind of molecular approaches, you can get that back very quickly. I also wanted to address your point from a while back about what kind of um, what kind of like naming header could this be under? There seems to be no sort of issues with the ICZN approach to this. So this should fall right in line with what we already use. Yes, and I'd like to point out something about your comment about older uh, references still being valid. Yes, that, that is true. However, when we're talking about these papers referring to molecular technologies when DNA barcoding wasn't even mentioned until, what was it, 2003 was when it really started being noticed in the um, scientific world, like being used more, more widely. I think for something like this, you need to have more current references because molecular technologies keep improving uh, vastly over, you know, just in the past 10 years, we've improved, like think about, you know, um, like microsats versus like RNA-seq and all these high throughput methods. So that's just something that, you know, you should consider when you're debating something like this. Yeah, great point, Joni. And uh, another uh, point that I would like to, to bring up um, Again, when we're thinking about uh, farmers identifying pests, um, again, just to go back to our Tay and Gordon 2019 paper on invasive species, they highlight that there are 40 different cryptic species of whiteflies. So if you're a farmer dealing with whitefly identification in your field, you need to know exactly what species you're dealing with. If, for example, you want to implement some type of biological control strategy, you have to know exactly what type of species you're dealing with. Um, and that's another highlight to uh, molecular advantages that um, if we want to go out and look for biological control agents, we can do this with a lot of ease um, and no longer have to think about rearing out parasitoids. Um, and in fact, we can just collect the genomic material from the parasitoids, particularly if they're endoparasitoids growing inside of a particular pest. Um, so I think that this is another approach. Um, and thinking again about uh, two, they, uh, a community science approach, I believe is what the, uh, the previous team had referred to. Um, again, this pest identification point that they've uh, brought up a few different times. Um, and I would just like to say that um, farmers are really excellent at knowing what's happening in their fields, but um, we can even just think about the common names that we use for a number of different pest species. We have three or four or five different common names that farmers are interchangeably using for the same exact pest. Um, so I think it's important too to think about, um, again, using these molecular techniques to know exactly which pest and which strain of a particular pest we're dealing with in a field to properly manage them. In using kind of arthropod discovery sort of through the app situation, so I realize there are a lot of new morphological situations that we can use for um, identifying morphology through taking pictures, but um, I think we may have all used the pictures at, at some point and gotten completely strange identifications. And while those are, are helpful, um, to really get that accurate information for pest identification as through Recessiella, white flies, things like that, to get appropriate and accurate um, pest identification, we'll need that molecular step to really show that point. And as far as discovering new species, 
a lot of the citizen science stuff is really biased towards really showy and pretty things uh, that people are looking for. And so the, the really discovery of new things is going to be rare. Also because we're not going to new places, it's hard to get people to, to just get up and travel to the tropics. These aren't things that are gonna prevail. And to uh, answer one of your previous questions about uh, asking for a citation in reference for insect uh, classification, we believe that this is common knowledge, this definition is common knowledge for this uh, debate for taxonomy, for identification and classification. So th th it is within our references uh, for what classification is, but yeah, we believe that this is, should be common knowledge for taxonomy. Yeah, and that's a great point, Joni, too, to just bring up yet again how um, really our team has highlighted how important- Team two, your time is up. <laughs> Thank you, Agatoris. Okay, so great job so far to both teams. Now it's time for questions from judges and audience. So can we bring our judges to the screen? Hello, judges. Okay, time for questions. You have 10 minutes or, you know, feel free to uh, just ask uh, as many questions as you want. And one, two, three. Yes, I have a question. So again, great job to both teams. I have a question for both teams. If you, or if we met in an elevator and you had about 15 seconds to give me kind of a quick a uh, punchy statement to round out your argument, uh, what would you say? Hi. Yes, um, I would say that uh, historically we've used morphological characteristics to um, frame our understanding of uh, classification in insects. But with, tech, you know, with the future of technology, um, technologies arise and they can benefit us and help us further our understanding of how things are identified and classified with insects. So it's, it's a powerful tool that um, we, are furthering, we are further developing and that can help us in a variety of ways that normally we've struggled like with immature insects and cryptic insects. So like this way is really helpful for um, the future. Sure, I can take that one. So my quick elevator pitch would be this. The theme is entomology for all and morphology can be used by all. Anybody can identify an insect using mor uh, morphology. Molecular is just um, really only useful to scientists. I would like to um, say that uh, I wouldn't say that it's only useful to scientists. I think that the general public needs um, communication, science communication for omics technologies and molecular technologies, which is actually something that I'm working on with my dissertation. I think that it's very important that we increase science literacy on omics technologies and molecular technologies. Thank you, Joanny. Let's have another question. Sure, I have one, Lena. Um, so my question is for the laboratories, the molecular team. Um, so you mentioned early on that taxonomy is a dying art, and so that to me raises the concern that increased reliance on molecular methods might be the nail in the coffin. Uh, and if, do you think um, that that would be an acceptable price to pay or, or is um, there some way that we could mitigate that? Yes, so I didn't say taxonomy was a dying art. I said that strictly using morphological characters is a kind of a dying art. I think that it definitely is more interdisciplinary and that molecular techniques will be a, a very big advantage for it, but it is rooted in morphology and there's no, there is no avoiding that. However, molecular technologies can further advance our understanding of taxonomy and lead to more interdis it's an interdisciplinary nature. So we have more collaborations with a variety of scientists, you know, biologists, entomologists, um, IPM, um, oh, like people doing evolutionary biology and that sort of thing. So it, taxonomy is not a dying art, quite the contrary. It's, it's just changing. It's, it's changing as time goes on. Thank you. All right, <laughs> sorry. Go oh, ahead. No, okay. and I'm, I'm just going to, oh, sorry. Should I add something really quick if that's okay? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. 
Sorry about that. Um, so I was just going to really quickly add a citation onto uh, what my teammate was saying. So um, from our paper, um, Progress, Pitfalls in Parallel Universes, A History of Insect Phylogenetics, Kujir et al. 2016, um, the authors there, or the authors note that um, morphology could really only take us so far in terms of insect taxonomy. And then it was really in terms of insect uh, or in terms of the molecular revolution that we were really able to tease apart um, some of these historically confounding questions um, in insect phylogeny. And um, in particular, this was uh, things like placing holometabolous insects. Um, and they give a few other examples in the paper, but I just wanted to uh, quickly throw that in to support Joni's argument. Thank you, Morgan. Anne, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I just wanna, um, 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 answer Ashley's question in addition to taxonomy being a dying art or how to save it. So we cited a paper, Waggle et al. in 2011 and how taxonomists is an endangered race. And there was a large proposal about how to survive it because lots of our papers don't even um, cite the taxonomists who first identified the insect or the key they use when they do the work in the field. And also many of our um, opponents references said like, while they use molecular technique, many of them said, we should still use, submit um, live specimen to museums as a document. And also that was mainly it. It's that it's hard to think that morphology doesn't depend, um, molecular does not depend on morphology. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Do you wanna ask questions please? All right, spacebar wasn't working. So uh, this question will be to both teams, but it's, the ire of it's really directed at the Aggies because they said 10 years is dated and I am older than 10, so I'm not a living fossil, but that sparked the question. Um, so for both teams, you kind of go through your approaches, but how would you deal with like the fossil record of classifying things? And both teams, please respond. Just, I wanna jump in really quickly. I'll, I'll let my teammates cover the fossils part, but as far as papers that are older than 10 years, I don't think that that's necessarily an issue. It's just the argument point that some of them were like, DNA barcoding doesn't work at all. And it's a 15 year old paper. We have come a long way in 15 years. I certainly have as well. So uh, can we go back to the other team just in case they have something else to say and then com come back here to you. So what about uh, the Ohio State University, do you want to answer that question as well? Sure. So on the topic of fossils and just uh, rare specimens in general that you can't necessarily damage uh, in order to perform a DNA analysis, uh, morphological ID is clearly uh, advantageous, I would say. Um, in addition to uh, not necessarily cryptic species, but immature life uh, stages as well. Um, this was actually a part of that uh, paper that use neural networks to identify different uh, insects. Um, one set was all uh, stonefly larvae that uh, the neural network performed very well at identifying the species. Agatoris? Yeah, so I can take the fossil question and I'm sure that Joni will have uh, some additional things to say, um, but I think that um, fossil, the fossil record is great for um, molecular techniques because it helps us to date our molecular clock. And basically it gives us a baseline of reference for um, how quickly some of these evolutionary changes are occurring over time. So I think that the fossil record actually pairs really well. Um, and uh, our Kajir et al. 2016 reference advances using molecular data in insect systematics highlights this point really nicely. And I'll give it uh, to Joni so she can add some more things. I'm sorry, Morgan. I, I want to give a chance to the other team if they okay. have something else to say. Sure. Um, just a quick note on the use of morphology for fossils from our reference short at all 2018. And they note that one of the modern advancements, digital 3D reconstructions of morphological features has been very useful for fossils, uh, particularly those in amber. Okay. So give me just one second. I wanna make sure our four judge uh, still have a question. Otherwise we can continue with uh, Chris question. No? Okay, so Agatoris, go ahead. Yes, and to uh, go back to what Morgan was saying about fossils, that's, she said it eloquently. Um, I would like to mention that, yes, um, with fossils, morphology definitely is um, 
valuable for looking at fossils and, and that sort of thing. But with setting up clocks and whatnot, it can aid with molecular uh, tech. However, when we think of the future and how species are actually going through speciation, molecular technologies would be more ideal for that type of situation. So it's kind of like looking at the past and the future. Um, it's just that molecular techniques uh, are, are very valuable, but you still have morphology being set in the way that taxonomy is doing. It's just that it's like I said before, things are just changing and uh, the, you know, being able to get DNA from fossils that might change throughout time, but yes, it, it is uh, a problem to actually get material from the samples, um, but it can aid in molecular tech and molecular tech can help with um, identifying species that are going through speciation. So it's kind of like two sides of a coin and one side's better for one and one side's better for the other. Thanks, Joanny. Dean number one. I want to respond to the fossil thing. And as Joni says, um, sounds like molecular is dependent on morphology still. And on our reference wines 2014, when we look at the fossil, the first thing we want to know is what is it? Um, and we can't use molecular techniques unless molecular phylogenies are reconstructed without error. And so it's still really important to have rigorous morphology-based phylogeny as a re uh, reality check for molecular results. Can I respond to that very quickly? Sure. I, don't, I just don't, I want to make it sure, clear that I don't think either of us are trying to argue that we can't have them, that we both rely on have each other. one, Q&A is over. Thank you, Atul Voting. Now, uh, we will have another break, another five minutes break, and we will start with our second topic. Thank you so much to both teams. You did really a good job. So uh, I know, and especially in this virtual world, thank you. And I hope everybody's uh, enjoying the debates. Okay, uh, let's restart our second part of the debate. Now we are going to uh, invite our unbiased introduction speakers uh, Patricia Prade and Katie Britt. They will present uh, what is the best current technology to address the locus swarms worldwide. Thank you, Lina. For topic number two, what is the best current technology to address the locus swarms worldwide? Katie and I work together with the help from Dr. Nugumbi. So in the insect pests are a serious problem for global ag agriculture due to crop yield reduction as a result of feeding and increasing production costs due to pest management. Certain insect pests like locusts have caused issues with agricultural pest management since they start off, off a great in civilizations and are often present, often present in swarming populations. Local swarms are present across a diverse range of global landscapes, such as Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Southwest Asia, and have even migrated to the Caribbean and North and South America. Local swarms can cover vast areas, some of which are inaccessible by humans, inhabitable, dangerously rocky, or covered by thorns. In some instances and in certain locations, it might make sense to manage locusts with conventional pesticides. However, due to the seasonality of locust outbreaks, costs associated with management, frequency of application, and risks to human and animal health, the use of pesticides is not a recommender or, or even a viable option to manage locusts in all affected areas. So there is a need for an integration of more than one method to manage locusts. This implementation of, the implementation of genetic modified crops, they are tolerant or resistant to locusts and the use of biocontrol agents and microinsecticides are two topics to be considered. However, the positive and negative uh, outcomes from the implementation of both methods must be considered. The use of genetically modified crops to manage unwanted insect pests first occurred in 1996 when the main targets were coleopteran and lepidopteran species. Since this work began, the list of target pests has expanded and studies focused on non-target effects have occurred to provide broader knowledge of use and selection of genetically modified crops. 
Research studies have shown that genetically modified crops can be toxic to locusts and can provide sufficient levels of management. However, the research and development involved with new genetically modified crop varieties is costly, requires specially equipped laboratories, and can take several years, making it not readily or immediately available when needed, especially in a time of crisis like the current global situation. Research for new strains may not always be a priority for research groups, and the development of new strains is not always specific to manage pests like locusts. So the use of biological control, especially when as part of an integrated pest management program, is a potential viable option. While classic biological control can be beneficial, upfront research costs can sometimes be very expensive, and time involved in conducting this research is lengthy and drawn out. This work should still be done, however, solutions are needed immediately. Mycoinsecticides show promise for managing insects from the acridity family. Bateman et al. studied metarhizium acridum to develop a formulation that is compatible with existing application equipment, is host specific, kills locusts, and is environmentally benign. Under laboratory conditions, Hunter found that imacritum causes 90 to 95% mortality in locusts within six to 10 days of application during warmer days with temperatures ranging from 36 to 40 degrees Celsius. Mild spring temperatures ranging from 20 to 30 degrees Celsius can slow the activity of mycoinsecticides with locust mortality occurring 10 to 14 days after application. While there are issues with mycoinsecticide efficacy and timing of activity, their use in environmentally sensitive areas early on in an outbreak is less expensive than not managing locust outbreaks at all. If left unmanaged, and if it is an option, swarming populations may eventually need frequent applications of synthetic insecticides when locust numbers have increased substantially and are directly threatening crops. While we are only highlighting two methods of locust management today, all viable options have positive and negative aspects. However, if management methods are combined in the form of an integrated pest management plan, the short and long-term solutions to manage locust outbreaks may be closer than expected. Thank you, Patricia and Katie. So now it's time for the team number one of the topic number two, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, to come to the screen and present your stance about why you think biological control or cultural control is the best way to... Okay, great. Please present your team as well. Thanks, Gina. So we are University of Nebraska-Lincoln supporting the argument for biological and cultural control method to address the local swarm worldwide. So here is the brief outline where I am going to discuss about the locust problem, the management tactics, uh, talking about the biological and culture control, and the challenges of GM crops, followed by the conclusion and the future prospects. Since the beginning of civilization, locust attack has been among the most devastating threats to agriculture. Whole world has witnessed several outbreaks in the previous decades. During the recession, the dry area followed by the rains and the floods re-energized the land for growing of grasses and acting as breeding area for the locusts. Their population upsurge and turning from solitary phase to the gregarious phase giving rise to swarms of locusts which migrate hundreds and thousands of miles. So here, the preventive management strategies comes into play where initial intervention and the scouting can help to identify the hotspot areas and those areas should be treated at the beginning to prevent the further invasion. Otherwise, this heavy invasion by locusts can lead to outbreaks or plagues resulting in huge damage in terms of economic, social and international impact at wide scale. And this is very discouraging. These invasions trigger the government for tie up at international levels for creative management of locust. There are different management strategies in integrated pest management for locust control, but in recent years, there has been an increased use of cultural and biological methods. Biological method includes the use of living organisms for the control of insect pests, including 
the microorganisms like fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes. For locus control, materism species like uh, materism species, Paranosema locusti, and the combination of microsporidium and fungus has offered successful control of locus. For locus management, culture control includes the habitat management, wise use of nitrogen fertilizer, planting of non host trees around the field would be a good control. I will discuss more in, about these in the next slides. So as I have mentioned in one of the previous slides that preventive management strategies are increasingly implemented as being the most rational, effective, economically feasible and environmentally sound methods of control. Biocontrol is one of them. Here, fungus-based pesticides act as important management component. In recent years, there has been a tremendous increase in the use of materasium and microsporidium paranosima locusti against the locust. Various labs and few studies have shown that the biopesticide use results in high mortality. More than 90% is achieved and which is really great and amazing. This depicts that the biocontrol is an appreciable and highly recommendable management tactic. So the commercial product available in the market for the farmer's use is green guard and also the green muscle. Here are some of the advantages of biocontrol use. Different studies have shown that the biocontrol agents can effectively control locusts in the field. They are highly target specific and safer to the non-target organisms they're also not posing any kind of harm to the environment, and they have the ability to cause episodics in the uh, fields by the scanty spread of the spores. The, the local production of the biocontrol agents can help in raising the local economies. The field applications can be done with the help of aerial sprays and the use of the ground equipment already used by the farmers for chemical control. So, uh, what are the what will encourage the farmers to use more biological control? High willingness of the farmers to pay for the pesticides. The virulence of the entomopathogens can be increased by various tools like RNAi or CRISPR-Cas9. The efficacy of entomopathogens can be increased by the use of different products like uh, using it with the neem products. Uh, coming to the culture control. Studies have mentioned that incorporation of non-host trees such as Robinia and Zizipus has reduced locust density by 90% and more research is required to identify the area-specific non-host species and way of incorporating them into the ecosystem. Flood mitigation and environment modification have helped in reduction of the potential breeding areas. At farm scale, Several numerous studies have shown that land use practices like the improvement in the soil fertility through organic matter management and increasing the length of the fallow can reduce crop infestations and outbreaks. So talking about a little bit uh, about GM crops, I agree that GM crop provide great opportunity for controlling various insect pests. We have a great example of BD crops here, but what about locusts? They're polyphagous. Can we develop transgenic for all the plant species on which they feed? Or is it economical to develop transgenic for all these species? Uh, could farmers afford the seed? Would the farmers need to plant GM crops every year? Can the seed be viable for the next coming years? Locust outbreaks are episodic and we have to think about that. What about the social backlash against the GM crops? So I would like to conclude here with some points like GM crop, sorry, the biocontrol have the good efficacy in labs and field and good environmental selectivity. These are implemented as preventative with good results and at a comparable cost as for the chemical control. These are environment sound management approach in the near term and the local biocontrol production may benefit local economies. And there is a lower risk of resistance development than insecticide or single gene traits in plant. And we can increase the efficacy of the biocontrol by the use of nanoparticles for their delivery. There is a need to explore other biocontrol agent fungi, like besides the fungi. And after all, there is a need to 
combine all the approaches together for the integrated management. Thank you. Thank you, Hina. Okay, so now um, we will invite the team number two by University of Florida, Purdue and Michigan State University to the screen so that they can present their stand why they think genetically modifying crops are the best approach to control the swarm locus worldwide. Okay, Kelly, are you ready? Yes, hi everybody. Um, my team is John Turnus, Sarah Anderson, Scott Gula, and Jacob Pachenka. I'm Kaylee Howery, and I'm going to be giving our talk. Locust swarms cause millions of hectares of damage during an outbreak. These pests are especially devastating because they are highly prolificous, and swarms are unpredictable and simultaneously impact many nations. Their wide range and diet create unique man management challenges and the potential for conflict when coordinating control efforts. This problem is expected to worsen as global climate change exacerbates two complementary challenges, more frequent conditions that favor locust breeding and nymph development, coupled with reduced efficacy of predictive modeling and outbreak response, according to Salih et al. in 2020. These pressures create a critical situation where the status quo must be reevaluated. Under current management practices, governments are hamstrung by the unpredictability of swarms and farmers can have their livelihoods destroyed in a matter of days. A long-term solution for controlling locust swarms must improve on the present situation and incorporate ease of implementation for farmers, low cost, accessibility, and effective management. Therefore, when we ask the question, what is the best current technology to address locust swarms worldwide? The answer is genetically modified or GM crops. This is our stance for two primary reasons. First, GM crops for locust management are safe, effective, and equitable. And second, biological and cultural control alternatives are expensive, labor intensive, and are prone to fail in the field against locusts. First, GM crops for locust management are uh, effective, safe, and equitable. BT is one of the most widespread and effective forms of GM crops. It is a form of transgenic crop where DNA from the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis is incorporated into plant cells, causing the plant to express proteins that are toxic to insects when consumed. Depending on the strain, different proteins are produced, many of which are highly specific to certain insects. Selecting the appropriate gene then allows control to be preemptive and targeted. BT strains exist that are highly toxic to both adult and juvenile migratory locusts, according to Song et al. in 2008. The authors go on to note that the effectiveness of this strain against adult locusts bodes well for the incorporation of this gene into crops. Therefore, incorporating these strains into target crops would lead to effective management. GM crops have added benefits that would make them even more desirable for farmers as well. The implementation of BT maize in the United States suppressed pest populations regionally, which conveyed protection to surrounding non-GM crops and reduced the need for pesticide applications in the area, according to Divley et al. in 2018. The use of pest-specific BT cotton varieties in China effectively reduced aphid density without adverse effects on beneficial insects, which increased in abundance, according to Liu et al. in 2012. Reduced pesticide application also has benefits on farmer health, as Carzoli et al. writes in 2018. This pattern is consistent across crops and countries. A 2014 meta-analysis found, on average, GM crop adoption reduced chemical pesticide use by 37% and increased farmer profits by 68%, according to Klumper and Quaim in 2014. GM technology has increased yields and profits in four of the world's most widespread crops, soybean, maize, cotton, and canola, according to Brooks and Barfoot in 2014. This makes GM crops a safe and economically beneficial option. Notably, yield and financial benefits of GM crops are actually greatest for small farmers in developing countries, which is historically the demographic most impacted by locust swarms, according to Carpenter in 2010 and Klumper and Quaim in 2014. Lastly, GM crops that incorporate BT can also be modified to have traits such as higher drought resistance or increased nutri nutrition. The same climate challenges that will make locust swarms more difficult to manage in coming years will also directly affect farmers and their crops with or without locust swarms that year. And GM crops can help ameliorate these difficulties as well as locusts. 
Because GM crops can be planted like any other crop, farmers already have the infrastructure and knowledge necessary to deploy the technology, making GM crops easily implemented and accessible for farmers. GM crops empower individual farmers to effectively limit damage from locust outbreaks while also providing increased yields, higher economic performance of crops, and fewer adverse health effects than conventional pest management strategies, according to Carpenter in 2010. Second, biological and cultural control alternatives are expensive, labor intensive, and are prone to fail in the field against locusts. One of the cornerstones of biological control of migratory locusts are biopesticides, especially metarhizium species. However, biopesticide efficacy varies depending on environmental conditions, according to Wilson et al. in 2002. This is of serious concern since environmental variability due to climate change is the main reason we expect locust outbreaks to become more serious. As a result, biopesticides are not a reliable, consistently effective management strategy. Cultural control is especially difficult in locust management because these methods need to be enacted at an international scale to be effective. Um, excuse me, uh, which can cause them to fail according to Gay et al. in 2020. In fact, to enact both cultural and biological control strategies, the first step is usually monitoring. However, conflict in certain locust breeding locations makes monitoring impossible as Gay in 2020 goes on to state. Unexpected disturbances such as the COVID-19 pandemic can create additional challenges related to monitoring, collaboration, and targeted treatment of locust bans, Sali et al. in 2020 writes. This, along with the size of the land that must be monitored, has caused researchers to actually lose track of locust bands that were being monitored in the past, according to Langwald in 2001 and Zhang et al. in 2019. Without the ability to monitor effectively, cultural and biological control practices are difficult to implement. Lastly, although it can seem counterintuitive, cultural control strategies can be environmentally harmful. Because of their migratory nature, drastic environmental or agricultural modifications, such as damming rivers, may be necessary to have an impact on locust development and spread, according to Zhang and Hunter in 2017. The ecological impacts of such measures have not been assessed, but needless to say, these approaches are difficult to implement, high cost, and inaccessible for individual farmers. In conclusion, GM crops are effective, benefit mar uh, farmers economically, improve farmer and environmental health, are easy to implement and are accessible. In contrast, biocontrol and cultural control are expensive, not consistently available, require large scale intervention and suffer from inconsistent efficacy. Global ch climate change is expected to make locust swarms worse, not better. Therefore, farmers need to have access to management technology they can rely on. For these reasons, the best current technology to address the locust swarms worldwide is GM crops. Thank you, Kelly. Now it's time for cross-examination of University of Nebraska, University of Nebraska Lincoln by University of Florida, Florida, Purdue, and Michigan State University. Okay. You have five minutes to ask questions or clarifications starting in one, two, three. Go. Okay, thank you, Lena. Uh, so you mentioned that farmers have a high willingness to pay for biopesticides, yet Petrescu Mag 2019 found that the primary factor influencing whether a farmer will pay more for biopesticides is if they are more effective than the alternatives they already have. Uh, farmers are unwilling to adopt more expensive biopesticides because they don't view conventional insecticides as ineffective in the first place, let alone that biopesticides are more effective. Um, additionally, uh, field persistence of biopesticides can be as little as uh, four days, as mentioned in uh, Peng et al. 2008. Um, would use of biopesticides require continuous application to achieve desired levels of control? Uh, and if so, do you think that the benefits of using biopesticides would outweigh the major costs associated with such repeated applications? In your introduction, you focus a lot on the use of biopesticides containing entomopathogenic fungi. However, Chandler et al. 2011 finds that over the last two decades, biopesticide sprays containing these fungi have largely been replaced by highly effective GM crop varieties. Does this not indicate to you that GM technology will be an essential tool in the implementation of entomopathogenic fungi against locusts in the future? Your paper, Fu et al. 2020, uh, discusses the paranosema uh, can be used to slow or prevent phase shifting from the solitary to the gregarious locust uh, 
wouldn't that reduce the spread of them not being clumped together and therefore the effectiveness of the other entomopathogenic pathogenic uh, biocontrol options that you've mentioned? Uh, your paper by C. et al. 2012 uh, says that farmers should drastically decrease levels of livestock grazing because low nitrogen soils associated with grazing may encourage locust outbreaks. Given that such a change would completely alter an established long-standing and important agricultural practice, do you think it's likely that farmers would be willing to significantly alter grazing practices as a form of cultural control against locusts? Additionally, uh, are the options of replacing um, host plants, both agriculturally and naturally, uh, as potential cultural controls. And these would be huge changes as well. Uh, you, you reference uh, biocontrol strategies as being preventative, uh, yet uh, how the increased difficulty in predicting these outbreaks due to climate change and increasingly unstable weather patterns in key regions, such as sub-Saharan Africa, uh, allow for preventative control? Tripathy et al. 20, or 2008 details how the GM papaya variety, Sunup and Rainbow, essentially saved the Hawaiian papaya industry from the brink of collapse after they were commercially released in 1998. Can you please provide an example of a time when biological control methods were similarly successful at protecting an entire agricultural industry? Uh, GM crops with insect resistant traits are considered widely a success story. Um, Brooks and Barefoot, one of our uh, papers provides that. Uh, would lower production uh, costs driving that due to the reduction uh, in pesticides? Are there any uh, existing examples similarly to biopesticides having a success reducing insecticide applications in a farming system? You mentioned the necessity to implement multiple tactics to ensure control despite cost and logistics being high for the production and application of even a single biocontrol agent. How would you compare that to a GM crop that can provide consistent control and less variation in yield according to Carpenter in 2010? Many of the successes that you cite uh, for biopesticides are occurring in Australia, um, such as in Hunter 2010. Uh, they found that the 100,000 hectares from 2009 or 2000 to 2009 that was used of biopesticides was likely more than the combined use of biopesticides across the rest of the world for locusts. Uh, so Australia has a single centralized government, no political conflict, consistent motivation to control locusts and no need for international co cooperation. How can countries in other locust regions expect to match these successes under far different political climates? To be effective, monitoring and rapid application of biopesticides to manage emerging swarms must occur at scales that often span multiple countries. However, in the past, collaborative cross-country efforts to monitor and control these emerging swarms has failed. Why do you propose that this method of control will succeed in the future? And what specifically would you propose to improve monitoring efforts? All right. Metarizium. Time up. Is that the time? That is the time, yes. Okay, thank you, uh, team number one. Sorry, two. <laughs> now we have the, our first review, review by uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. You have five minutes, guys, to answer questions or how you want to use it. And one, two, three, go. Thank you. Uh, science is not science is far more than what we think about. There is a solution for every problem. So Zangaton 2019 have mentioned a most remarkable recent advance has been the use of biopesticides as important component of management problem program. So you are asking about the successful examples. So although these are very slow acting compounds, these are very still effective. We have evidences where these biopesticides are used at field level and performed very well in controlling the swans. So Fang et al. at 2014 mentioned that green mussels has green mussel has been tried in Madagascar, Niger, Senegal, and Sudan, but its largest trial started in May 2009, where it successfully contained an outbreak of red locusts uh, that were threatening crops in East and Southern Africa. 
and most infected locusts died with one to three weeks and had 80% mortality. That means they are worthy of use and a similar product, as you have already mentioned, it, is in, it, it has been used in Australia. And similarly, it has been used in China for the uh, protection of crops against locusta migratoria. Um, and for the and for the other question, especially regarding the farmer acceptability and their willingness to pay for a higher price for the biopesticides, so Pet Rescue Mac at all in 2019, so they wanted to check if the farmers in Romania, if they want to pay uh, like way more than for the biopesticides, when at the same time conventional insecticides options are available. So in that case, uh, during that survey, they have listed several issues related to the conventional insecticides. So the, what they have found, 69.8% of the total people, they showed willingness to the replace conventional with the biopesticides. And then 54.8% of the people were willing to uh, pay for the biopesticides. And 73% of the people agreed with the fact that biopesticides have the same or better efficacy as conventional insecticides. So considering just note the example of Romania, there were uh, sub, some other countries which were considered in the discussion, discussion section. So in Pakistan, a survey was carried out where, the, where they showed that higher the risk, the risk of pesticides on health perceived by farmers, the higher the willingness to pay a premium for safer biopesticides. And then in Nicaragua, farmers are willing to pay up to 28% of the pesticide expenditure to avoid health risks. And then in China, farmers were willing to pay uh, more for the health risk reduction associated with the pesticide use. And the similar thing has been uh, seen in Nepal, where they were willing to pay between 53% and 79% to protect both the health and the environment. So answering to the question, basically based on all this data, farmers are willing to pay more for the biopesticides, not just considering that they are equally um, efficient in controlling the locusts as compared to insecticides, they are also considering the other facts. It should be safer to the farmer's health. And speaking about the cultural control, Sangatal in 2019, they found that in China, flood mitigation, environmental modification has helped in reduction of potential breeding areas. And these flood mitigation structures can be developed as a sustainable landscape features that can help not only in mitigating floods, but also add habitat resources for various pollinators and non-target organisms. Zhang et al. 2017 mentioned incorporating non-host trees such as Rubinia and Zizifus have reduced locust density by 90%. More research is required to identify area-specific non-host species uh, and, uh, and ways of incorporating them into ecosystems for example, incorporating by, by incorporating agroforestry tools and increasing the diversity in agricultural landscapes. At farm scale level, numerous studies have shown that land use practices, for example, improvement in soil fertility through the addition of organic matter management or increasing the length of the fallow land can reduce crop pest infestations and outbreaks. Not only that studies on insect herbivory suggest that there is a strong link between soil fertility and success of the biocontrol efforts. So if we are improving soil control, uh, soil um, fertility, we are also improving the biocontrol efforts by that. There are so many options such as incorporating nitrogen fixing crops, especially that are non hospicious such as co groundnut, cotton, alfalfa into the cropping system by improving composting, mulching and diversification of the agroecosystems. So it has long-term effects and might not observe something very instantly. And these cover crops can help in enhancing the uh, soil fertility too. So there is no harm okay. of using them. Okay, now we uh, will go with a cross-examination by University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Team, you have five minutes starting now. Unmute yourself. Um, so regarding the first of all, um, I um, so basically the other team presented a very good view of the BT crops and how the BT crops could be useful and what are the advantages of the GM crops. So opposing team, they have submitted few papers like Carzoli et al. 2018 that focuses on the BT maze for the assessment of risk and opportunities. And then they have other paper on meta-analysis of the impacts of the GM crops. So in these papers, they have mainly studied agronomic, agronomic impacts 
and and we also agree with all of these facts like bt could be safe beneficial and there are list of benefits coming coming so on but when it come in terms of locus control we need to consider the gm crops there are few questions regarding the possibility of utilizing gm crops and he now also mentioned these points in the presentation as well locus are polyphagous it doesn't need more details like what's their nature of feeding and what uh, what's their impact of damage so they are extremely devastating and they are um, devastating to the crops and the pastures as well do we have enough resources to develop gm crops for all of the uh, crops for the locust eat and can we grow gm crops all the way throughout the locust swamp path so these are the few questions and so and other thing uh, that was mentioned by other team uh, another option another thing was mentioned by another team about the environmental impacts the success of like biocontrol in different areas the same thing also goes with the gm crops all the gm crops varieties are not successful everywhere so this is the one of the another thing so can we plant all of the gm crops uh, resistant to locusts everywhere the second part of the discussion is the farmer acceptability and we we need to answer the critical question that they will eat the seed every year with insecticide uh, ge crops the greatest benefits have derived from reduced insecticide use yeah we we uh, we, we accept that but what benefits are derived from using more ex expensive seed when the target pest may only be serious problem once uh, every 10 to 15 years of course pattern of locust lo uh, locust may change with climate change but that change could also make them less of a problem nevertheless if it is uh, really a pest the growers feel compelled to use more expensive seed on a yearly basis due to difficulty predicting outbreaks and grow growers may lose money if they use uh, genetically engineered seed when no locust pro problem arises the ga uh, the genetically engineered crop provides no benefit to the growers assuming the tech in the plant is highly specific against locust um it provides no benefit against other pests therefore these examples of benefit of current uh, crop targeting important seasonally consistent crop pests are good but are not relevant to the situation with the locusts in your paper joga et al 2016 it is talking about the rnai efficiency in journal this paper mainly focuses on rnai based pest control strategies without making transgenic paper clearly shows more weightage to the cons over the pros pros of transformative rnai figure 2 in the paper describes the pros and cons of transformative and non transformative stra strategies non transformative strategy strategies has more benefits topical Uh, non transgenic delivery consumer acceptance low cost treatment feasibility and affordability over one disadvantage of continuous supply of ds rna product whereas in case of transformative strategies the disadvantage of extensive regulatory process high cost and low consumer acceptance outweigh the advantage of being efficient and long term control this figure clearly indicates that non transformative strategies show stronger potential over the transformative strategies based on this paper submitted by your team how can they say that gm crop offer real solutions um and the other team also, also mentioned, mentioned about the implementation, the implementation of bt maize they suppress the pest population in the surrounding non gm crops as well and the other sentence like in the first sentence of the abstract they submitted they mentioned locust swarms devastate regional food production and locust swarms can consume 136 million kilograms of crops and livestock forage in a single day so based on this data they provided and the other thing about the uh, since like bt can be successful for the lepidopterans but locusts they are highly devastating and they also mentioned how they can say that gm crops offer solution to the locust even to the non gmo crops all right time is up thank you team number 1 so now we have our first reviewal by university of florida purdue university michigan state university guys you have 5 minutes starting now yeah so you ask specifically about what um what benefits could come from more expensive seed uh and the how growers could um could deal with that so we actually have a few papers here where uh they found so Vital 2010 uh found in Burkina Faso 
that BT cotton, um, first, there's no significant difference between the production costs of these uh, treated seeds. So as economies of scale increase, we're going to have uh, those production costs even cheaper and it will be more available for farmers. Uh, they are more expensive currently for farmers, but this uh, is always offset by the savings uh, from the reduced insecticide inputs. It's also important to note that many of the GM crops are less specific than many of the biopesticides. So they do still offer some value that biopesticides uh, don't, even when, when there are no locust outbreaks. Uh, so in that system, uh, yields of BT cotton were much higher than their conventional counterparts. Uh, increases of nearly 20% were found in Africa um, by Vital and Carzoli et al. found 50% increase in yields uh, with BT. Um, and then also Clumper and Quaim found 68% uh, increases in profits for farmers in developing countries. Additionally, you asked uh, if every crop would need to be replaced with a uh, genetically modified crop, and the answer is no. Um, in the paper uh, by Divley et al. Uh, from 2018, uh, it highlights uh, studies done where um, the pest pressure in BT crops were studied, uh, a couple different crops, corn, cotton, and soybeans. Uh, but they found that all of these crops actually had a spillover effect that uh, reduced pests in nearby non-BT crops, um, including completely different vegetables, uh, and that uh, these benefits even extended to organic growers that, that live nearby. You uh, mentioned the, the Petrush Mag et al. paper. Um, and said that 69% of people were willing to replace with biopesticides, but I actually wanted to clarify that that 69% of people who think conventional pesticides are inefficient. However, the paper also found that 81.7% of people thought that they were efficient. So really that's not a very high number and I just wanted to clarify that. Um, wanted to talk about uh, some of the existing products uh, using the metarizium, the green guard or uh, green muscle products, uh, talking about some of the field trials. A lot of them uh, that have been done in Western and Central Africa have, though they've been field studies, they've had a pretty limited size, only from four to 14 uh, square kilometers. And that's uh, really pretty limited compared to the large areas that would need to be applied to have any sort of effective control. And then I was wondering if, if the, the team could comment on what they think some of the limitations have been. Uh, these, these products, the Green Muscle and, and Green Guard have been around, but papers such as uh, theirs, Bateman et al. Uh, talks about that there's been formidable uh, bureaucratic hurdles due to uh, registering these products in a lot of African countries and uh, ones that are places where they are registered, such as Green Guard in Australia, has had a pretty limited use in uh, it quotes only uh, limited scale in an organic agriculture. And I was wondering what has been uh, the big hurdle in making those jump to the next level of widespread production. So I wanted to bring up something that you uh, mentioned in your rebuttal about timing and how critical timing is for managing these locust swarms, because as you said, they can devastate a large area in a single day. However, I think if you weigh the evidence, BT crops actually are more effective in this sense. So you brought up a couple of papers that say um, that in addressing an outbreak, um, researchers didn't start to see mortality with some of these fungal and uh, microsporidia pesticides for one to three weeks, which is significantly longer than how often it takes or how quickly BT crops start to become effective. You also mentioned long-term habitat altering as a better alternative to these BT crops, but you also say those are not going to show immediate results. So if the question is what is the best technology to manage the current locust swarms worldwide, why should we prefer these uh, strategies that won't even be effective for decades over something like BT crops, which will, you know, be able to kill locusts in a matter of days. Yeah, and to add on to that, uh, much of your your papers are really focused on uh, stopping swarms that are that are developing. So I think with the question being the current swarm, swarms that are that are happening, how? Thank you, team number two. Okay. Now it's time for the recession. You can take a break, five minutes break, please, and come back. Uh, we will be back in, at 1.37 p.m. Uh, Easter time.
Thanks. Hello again. Um, now we, it's time for our second review uh, by University of Nebraska Lincoln. Okay, guys, you have five minutes to ask questions or answer questions uh, starting now. Um, so Miller et al. in 2009, they have done some studies on the crowded locust and where they, where they have found that when the locusts are in swarms and they are, when they got infected with the biopesticides, even the next generation, their offsprings, they're more susceptible to the biopesticides as compared to the known sprayed one, like which were not treated with biopesticides. So it has some like legacy effects, biopesticides, although they are slow, slow in control, but they have some legacy effects. You have, mentioned, you have mentioned in your abstract uh, that preventive measures are very crucial for locust management. How can GM be used as a preventive measure? Till now, there is not even a single GM crop available which can provide protection to locusts. Then how can they, these offer a real solution for the current outbreak? And for, and for GM to be effective, we are allowing the locust to breed at high level in interior areas and then inviting them to our crops for their food. But we need to focus on preventive measure when we can prevent the breeding at earlier stages and prevent the outbreak. In this way, we cannot save our agriculture crops, but, uh, but also the grasslands, pastoral and forest trees. How can GM crops be used as preventive measures and locust outbreaks initiates from remote areas and then spread across towards the crops? The utility of the micro pesticides can be improved. Fang et al. 2014 has reported that the use of the recombinant strain of metaresium expressing four insect neurotoxins has improved the efficacy of metaresium against accurate by reducing the lethal dose and time to kill the locust. In this way, we can reduce the time. If the survival could be reduced, metaresium might be applied later to prevent a sudden swarm outbreak. And there was a question on climate change and the uncertain environmental conditions. In this case, very recent GIS and GPS tools, uh, such as locust management system using multi-agent model, uh, for example, ALMAS, which, uh, which replicated over a virtual and uniform area, uh, the, dis the dispersal of devastating swarms faced by management stakeholders can be taken into consideration. And there are another technologies like MODIS, which is mod moderate resolution imaging, spectro radiometer images, and also the NDVI technology in which they compare the greenness and the bareness of the fields to, uh, and when these all of these technologies combined with the historical data, they're, they're, we can uh, we can improve the monitoring, surveillance, and reporting of these uh, outbreaks, and then controlling in in a very timely fashion. So um, even for the GM crops and or any kind of strategy, we still need these tools to identify those areas where the locust outbreaks are gonna start. So even in case so if we identify those areas like uh, where the locusts are gonna spread out, we can still uh, bring biopesticide there. But for GM crops, we have to wait till the last minute. First of all, um, they have to extend till the, to the outbreak stage and then they will move to the field. And at that time, I don't think they're gonna, when they're already at outbreak stage, maybe GM crops won't be able to provide protection against them. So I'm gonna repeat one more question again. So what's the take of another team? Can we make transgenic of all the crops for the locust management? And and other thing is that let's suppose if we make that and then uh, farmers have to plant every year irrespective of the thing if the locust comes or not and sometimes it just comes like in 10 to 15 years. Like in South America, locust came after like 60 years. So these are a uh, few things which uh, we need to keep in mind. And uh, there is one more point on uh, non-GM crops, like in case of lepidopterans. Uh, in case of lepidopterans, um, basically, uh, if they are feeding on the BT and the non-GM crops surrounding those areas can still be protected. But in our case, when the locusts are highly devastating, it's very hard to control, like they can fly kilometers, kilometers, or like thousands of kilometers in a day. And now the coming back to the our question, what is the current best scenario? So the, based on all the things that till date, we don't have any single GM crop available for the locust management, biological 
Con uh, control can offer some good solutions. It has it has shown good efficacy in the lab and field conditions. It has environmental safety, and it can also move with the infected insects as they move and spread within the populations. And other pathogens can also be used in conjunction and to increase that. And there is a very very lower risk of resistance development than the chemicals. So and still in case of BT, we have the several cases for the development of resistance. The other team, which hasn't um, brought in attention of, uh, in our attention yet, so your time. Okay, thank you, team number one. So now we have the review by uh, team number two. And one, two. Okay, let's wait for them to appear in the screen first. Okay, great. So you can start your time in three, two, one, go. Yeah, so I wanted to touch a little bit on your question about uh, preventative versus curative protection of crops. Uh, and specifically, we believe that IPM practices such as monitoring locust bans uh, are still an important part of uh, locust management. That That's something that you can help identify them and cut down on swarms. Uh, but this is also something that has been shown repeatedly through conflict and coronavirus, all of these, these major disturbances that can break down very easily. And in those situations, farmers are often left uh, in a state where they don't have many options other than uh, insecticide use, uh, which we both can agree uh, has some challenges, both uh, from a human health perspective, but also environmentally. And so these farmers really have to have another option uh, that is effective. And if you're telling them that option is to spray a biopesticide that isn't going to have any effect um, for a week or more, then that's not a very attractive option. So that would be our, our stance on that is that this provides them the opportunity to actually protect their fields in a way that, that biopesticides don't. And just to briefly expand on that, you mentioned that, you know, right now we don't have a GM crop that's in use for locusts. What we do have is technology that we know is effective. We know GMs in general are effective. We know this BT strain is effective, not only against adults, but also against juveniles. And when you compare that to um, the biopesticides and the cultural control methods, those have been around for decades. We're in the middle of a locust worm right now. So I think we can say that we need something that improves on this current technology and that would be GM crops. Yeah, uh, and, and you can talk about how effective these, uh, these biopesticides are. Uh, and according to your reference, uh, Lomer et al. 2001, testing the lethality of a biopesticide in the lab or in a field cage can give unrealistic results because the conditions prevent the locusts from properly thermoregulating. According to Gardner and Thomas 2002, uh, subtle changes in temperature can prolong the survival of locusts for weeks or even months. Uh, considering that many of your references, such as Hunter et al. 2001, Peng et al. 2008, and Fang et al. 2014 use either lab or field caged assays in some capacity to test their biopesticides, can we really believe all the claims uh, of their efficacy in controlling these locusts in the field? Uh, could researchers overlooking the importance of a locust's ability to behaviorally fever uh, be the reason for the poor and erratic performance of these biopesticides in the past? Additionally, you've brought up multiple times that GM crops may not be effective in preventing locust outbreaks on a broader scale, so not just where the GM crops themselves are planted. But we know from a paper published by Lou et al. in 2012 that widespread adoption of BT cotton in uh, China actually did increase a natural enemy population and associated ecosystem services from that natural enemy and thus helped reduce enemies to cotton there even in non-BT fields. So there actually is evidence of GM crops being effective in other places and having an, a broader reach than just exactly where they're planted. Uh, another reference of ours that talked about similar stuff was uh, the Divley et al. paper looking at the mid-Atlantic United States where major row crop systems such as corn, cotton, and soybeans when BTs uh, were applied adjacent fruit and vegetable crops saw an economic benefit, reduced pest pressures, and in those cropping systems that did not have any BT products on them, they actually benefited in uh, having to apply fewer pesticides. 
and talking about uh, the repeated use of GM seeds and uh, instances that that cost might be uh, building up. Uh, what it actually found is, is piggybacking off of that is when these uh, BT technologies are used, your overall insecticide inputs are lowered. And so Carpenter, uh, one of our references showed that 36 of uh, 61 uh, farms in developed countries and 88 out of 107 in developing nations saw an economic benefit when comparing your GM crops to non-GM. So uh, there's a pretty wide uh, berth of evidence showing that in a lot of variable systems, there's going to be an economic benefit to the use of GM crops. And even if farmers do end up planting these crops every year without locusts, we mentioned just in our opening statement how much benefit they could get from these in the face of other climate challenges that we know are going to exacerbate these locust problems. GM crops can have more than one trait. They can have traits like drought resistance. That's increasingly important, and that's going to also provide yield benefits, reduced food insecurity, according to Carzoli et al. in 2018, as well as farmer health benefits, which are so important. And just to get at efficacy real quick, Langwald et al. 97 found that only approximately 51% of locusts were infected directly by uh, biopesticide sprays. The rest were infected through exposure to infected locusts or contact with sprayed vegetation. Sorry, your time is up. Okay, thank you, team number two. So now it's time for questions from uh, judges and or the audience. So I will ask one judge at least, okay, first, uh, yes, uh, if they have one question, and if not, I will uh, go to the uh, audience. Hannah, do you have any questions? Yes, so thanks again to both teams, great job. I just have one question for both teams, if you could answer for me, and maybe both teams have already mentioned it, but can you just give a brief uh, summary statement kind of to tie things up, uh, giving examples of where GM or uh, biocontrol products and successfully controlled locusts. And so if you could just list the crop and maybe the country where it's been affected. I can tell you about the uh, countries which have used the biopesticides. So these are Madagascar, Niger, Senegal, Sudan. And in 2014, they have started using of these to control the attack of um, a nomad, uh, locus nomadicris and septi fasciata. And, and and in addition to that, so uh, recently similar product they has been used in Australia and um, sorry, so there's a similar product Kiloka. The name is Kiloka that is being uh, commercially produced in China, one of the biotech development company and another country that use biopesticide on metahesium that uh, own around 750,000 hectare of sugarcane and 250,000 of grassland annually is recommended by Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations. And this has been referenced by Chandler et al. in 2011. But still, there are a few examples of crops. But in case of locusts, it's very, very hard to mention about the crops because locusts are polyphagous. And that again goes back against the stance of another team because locusts are their polyphagous. We cannot make transgenic for all the crops. This is going to be very hard. And the other team, they also have mentioned about the natural enemies, the safety. So we have to remind it again, the topic is not about the safety of the BT or the GM crops. We are trying to find what is the best current scenario to manage the locust population. Thank you, Sajan. The other group wants to say something? Sure, so thanks for the question. Right now, there are not commercially available GM crops that incorporate BT for locusts. What we do have is our Song et al. 2008 study shows high uh, effectiveness of BT strain, BTH13, that does target both adult and juvenile locusts. It was fed to the um, experimental uh, nymphs and adults on crop plants of multiple different varieties. So we are confident that this technology does work. It just needs to be commercialized, but that should not be a, a large barrier to implementing this for locust control. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi, I wanted to add one point on Song et al. 2008, that it was applied on corn seeds and then it was fed to, uh, fed to the locust. So here it is that it is still used as a biopesticide. So they are like helping our point to, to hear. 
Can it, we respond? It, it was not used as a GM crop. Okay, thank you, Sudati. Go ahead, Kelly. Right, so that's correct. However, we've provided multiple pieces of evidence about why it's more effective to take those strains and incorporate them into the crop itself rather than spraying, which runs into all kinds of efficacy problems. So this specific strain, that gene, could be easily incorporated, as the authors mentioned, into the crop, which is how it's most effectively fed to the locusts and causes most effective control. Okay, so now let's move to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Patricia, can you read us? Yes. So one of the question is for GM crop argument, how do GM crops connect to off field locust population and the ecosystems? Would the biocontrol argument make more sense for both in field and off field locust outbreaks in the long term? Yeah, so there's a few things about that. Um, first, I that we're not uh, saying that this is the only control method that that can be used. You still have to monitor. I think both sides agree that that an integrated approach is the way to to really accomplish good management of locusts. So we we understand that you're really targeting this in in farm and not controlling outside of farm as much, except for when they come through and then you're you're stopping them from going to subsequent. Uh, farms as a swarm. But the really important key here is that although their monitoring strategies say that they can accomplish this, in practice, they are not accomplishing this. They're leaving farmers susceptible to these problems because the, the implementation isn't happening effectively. Uh, disturbances like COVID, conflict, uh, it can be really hard to monitor these things, get uh, boots on the ground in the right place, and then they move very rapidly. So what is hap actually happening is that when your entire strategy is based around monitoring and biopesticides, you're leaving your farmers really open uh, to not having options on the farm. And then they're often turning to these insecticides that we uh, have both agreed can be really damaging. Uh, just, to, just to add here for about the successful example, uh, in the past 20 years, the bee farmers of Australia have been using just biopesticides uh, and uh, biocontrol agents for controlling the locust population, and they have no, not seen any outbreak there. And those, those bee farmers uh, export all of their produce to Japan, and it has been a very successful model. And what about those uh, restricted areas where you can't use any pesticide or, or the PT varieties? Uh, and also, like, um, uh, yeah. So I would mention that that doesn't address any of the issues we've brought up of these problems in areas with more conflict or where you have multiple countries all that need to coordinate together. And that's the other big problem with these you know, strategies. For example, another issue with these off-farm pasture lands or areas where you can't spray. The solution that the other team offers is things like altering how organic matter is managed for these pasture lands. That involves, that needs involvement from all kinds of people all doing that. It's very labor intensive and that doesn't necessarily offer better protection unless everybody's involved and shifting the way that they do all of their grazing and pasture management. So what we can expect from GM crops is protection for these, uh, these non-direct crop areas as we bring up with our multiple references that's occurred in multiple countries. So keep in mind that this has to be easily implemented to be effective. We've seen that these technologies that maybe are working in Australia aren't working in other regions, whereas GM crops just need to be planted into the field. That's easy, that's accessible. Thank you. Another question from the audience? Uh, yes, so here we go. Due to the spatial scale, once locusts reach a major upsurge level, management typically happens at the level of regional, national, or international organizations. Example, Go government field officers or international team, teams implementing response, as opposed to a level of the farmer. Could you, could you reframe your arguments from that perspective and discuss how your technological approaches would be applied in that governance structure? Anybody can answer right now. Yeah, in this case, we... Uh, sorry. In this case, we need uh, we need intergovernment uh, intergovernmental interventions and also involving uh, 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 international agencies like FAO. Um, it it can also involve into like at uh, at local level involving local farmers and workers 
for identifying those areas so what our aim is uh, as a preventive is that we don't want it to reach to that outbreak level we need to control it in that level only and 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 of course uh, when when it it is an outbreak we need to have like best uh, best solution there like what what is the best way we can control it and it it might be like we can use bio control agents and bio, bio pesticide and also uh, in combination with the chemical pesticide like banned application and thus redu reducing the chemical application there I'd like to add something for for our team's perspective as well so in an ideal world right you would have sort of government level controls over locust populations. But we've seen in the past that efforts to do that and efforts to apply pesticides early, monitor bans have all failed. And so the benefit of GM crops is actually that you're putting the power in the hands of individual farmers to protect their own fields. So that they don't have to rely on these ineffic inefficient, ineffective systems that have failed them in the past. So that's actually one benefit of GMs. Um, so if we talk about the like if we are giving a power to farmers to control their like to manage the insect population in their fields but at the same time i have the same argument again and again that's like if for a second we agree that there is no safe, uh, like there are no safety issues everybody is accepting gm throughout the world everything is okay if we for a second we assume that still we cannot make transgenic for all of the crops what locusts want to eat. So they are like polyphagous and highly devastating. And if, let's suppose if they're going to eat on one crop that is like GM crop, and maybe they're they, they going to skip that, they're going to move to some other thing. They have an option to make choice. And especially, uh, how like how about pastures? How about grasslands? Can we make transgenic? Right, the time is up. Okay, thank you so much to both teams. You did an excellent job. So now, uh, I guess with this, we conclude the debate. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended and participated with asking questions. I hope everybody enjoyed these uh, debates. And I want to remind, uh, remind everybody that winners will be announced uh, this afternoon in the student award ceremony at 6.30 p.m. Easter time. Please come and join to congratulate uh, your peers. Excellent job.